Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> Hello, good morning. Uh, welcome to the seminar on proteinopathies. Today we have Mei Hong from the chemistry department at MIT. Mei is very well known for her outstanding contributions towards the development of uh, solid state and MR methodologies um, and applications of solid state MR techniques to uh, address biological problems. Um, understanding to better understand antimicrobial peptides function and membrane associated viral proteins and amyloid proteins and plant cell walls. Very interestingly that I learned that May started as an economics major in Fudan University, Shanghai. When she moved to Mount Hollywood College in USA, she shifted to chemistry, luckily for us. Um, then she, after completing the bachelor's degree from Hollywood College, she joined the Pines Group at UC Berkeley to complete PhD, and then went on to do postdoc work with the, with the Griffin uh, at MIT. She then joined UMass Chemistry Department, Amherst, um, uh, for a short while, and then she moved to Iowa State University Chemistry Department. Now recently, she moved to MIT. Obviously, May received uh, many honors. Uh, I'm going to just mention a couple of them. Um, she received uh, NSF Career Award, ICMRBS uh, Founders Medal, Laukin Medal from ENC, and recently ACS Nakanishi Prize. So with that introduction, I would like to welcome May. May, virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Rams, for the kind introduction. Uh, so it's a pleasure to uh, share my lab's uh, work, recent work with uh, this audience. Uh, so. Um, and today I would like to talk about two uh, amyloid proteins uh, whose structure and dynamics uh, have been investigated by my group in the last uh, uh, one and a half years or so. So one is the tau protein and the second is glucagon. And I think for this audience, the tau protein is, uh, should be pretty familiar uh, because previous speakers, uh, various speakers have uh, already touched on this talk, I've talked about this quite, quite a lot. So I'll be uh, brief about the, uh, the background. So uh, we know tau protein is, uh, binds and stabilize, stabilizes uh, the microtubules in neurons. So it it's serves a biological function. Uh, and uh, natively it is unfolded, uh, but when it uh, aggregates uh, upon hyperphosphorylation, then it uh, becomes uh, disease causing, and there are many tau related diseases, uh, tauopathies, uh, and different diseases have different manifestations, and that has to do in some way uh, that is, I think, not uh, well understood uh, with the isoforms of this tau protein in hey, your. May, sorry to interrupt. Do you have the PowerPoint slides in the presentation mode? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> all right, let me just. Okay, all right, you see it? Yeah, good. thank you. Um, yeah, hold on. Uh, back. Um, so there are six isoforms of tau in human brains, uh, and three of them have four microtubule binding repeats, R1, R2, R3, R4, and then, uh, 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 and then three of them, oh, sorry, three and three, three of them have four microtubule binding re repeats and three have uh, only three microtubule binding re repeats, skipping the R2 domain. Uh, and these microtubule binding repeats constitute about 25 to 30% of the protein. The rest is uh, relatively disordered. Uh, and there's a particularly a protein rich domain, uh, which is of interest. Uh, so since the 1980s, people already know from these electron micrographs that uh, the uh, tau protein forms in, in disease brains, such as Alzheimer's disease, uh, has this uh, fuzzy exterior uh, in, uh, that encase the uh, underlying uh, core. And uh, so the underlying beta sh uh, sheet core can have two manifestations in uh, Alzheimer's disease, the perihelical filaments, and the straight filaments, and you can, if you apply pronase, you can remove this fuzzy uh, exterior. Now that was the low resolution view about three decades ago, and uh, as we know, uh, you know, 30 years later, uh, in 2017, there's this groundbreaking study, uh, Fitzpatrick et al. in Nature, that uh, gave us the high resolution view of the Alzheimer's disease uh, tau uh, paired helical filament, as well as the straight filament structures, and you can see that this uh, rigid beta sheet core uh, underlying the, this, these uh, cross beta fibros uh, is actually a very small portion of the protein, uh, about uh, 73 or 4 uh, residues uh, and, uh, and spans R3 and R4 
of the, the uh, two of the microtubule uh, uh, binding repeats. Now, Alzheimer's disease is one of these tauopathies that is a mixed isoform type. It has um, both the uh, 3R and 4R type, and it occurs in the brains at about one to one, uh, roughly uh, equimolar ratio. So, uh, so this is interesting that, uh, you know, how do these uh, different tau's actually come together to make this homogeneous uh, molecular level structure is a very intriguing question. Now, one might ask uh, from these cryo-EM uh, wonderful structures, uh, you know, what do we know about the homogeneity or consistency of the tau uh, rigid beta sheet core uh, structure variation among different Alzheimer's disease brains? And this paper, subsequent paper from the same group, uh, showed that basically the confirmation, the molecular level confirmation, is very similar across, you know, multiple AD brains. Uh, as long as they're, you know, all AD, uh, and you have the same uh, kind of, uh, you know, for the paired helical filament, you have these two C-shaped uh, uh, structures uh, coming together. Uh, and then for the straight filament, the dimer interface uh, changes, but the underlying monomer's uh, C-shape uh, remains more or less uh, the same. So, so it appears from this early first uh, set of studies that uh, within a disease that the tau uh, rigid uh, beta sheet core has the same uh, conformation, and if you know from the same group, Sherry's uh, lab, that if you look at the uh, other tauopathies like chronic uh, traumatic encephal encephalopathy, which is also a 3R, 4R mixed tau, so both isoforms uh, exist in the brain, then they get almost the same kind of uh, conformation. Of course, there are some differences, but uh, the fold, um, the rigid beta sheet, uh, encompasses about the same portion of the protein and you have these two C-shaped, uh, you know, molecules coming together as the basic dimer uh, core. And, uh, but if you move to a PIX disease, uh, which has only the 3R tau version, then you see that the rigid beta sheet core covers a pretty different and a larger, more expanded region of the protein, starting from R1 and then going all the way to uh, about uh, 378, residue 378. So, um, so from these, uh, you know, really nice uh, cryo EM uh, structures, one can start asking uh, questions. Uh, so these cores are all really small portion of the protein. So what would be, you know, the structure and the dynamics of the residues that are not showing up in these uh, cryo EM structures? Uh, is you know the, the the part that's invisible completely disordered, or do they retain residual structure? And um, what is the level of mobility or dynamics for the rest of the protein N and C termini? And how do uh, the the uh, these other portions of the protein actually interact with the beta sheet core and perhaps shape uh, the conformation of uh, the beta sheet core? So these are the kind of questions that uh, we're interested in and. Uh, NMR, solid state NMR is one, one of the few, uh, very few methods that can actually allow you to look at both the structure and dynamics uh, of uh, these uh, heterogeneous uh, protein systems. Now, um, in order to apply solid state NMR, one has to contend with the sensitivity. Uh, and NMR sensitivity is relatively low. You need milligram quantities of uh, proteins, unlike cryo-EM, which requires much less material. And so we want to switch to, of course, the in vitro uh, studies. We, we can't just work with, you know, microgram quantity of uh, brain-derived material. And immediately, when you think about how to you know, make in vitro tau fibrils. The question arises, uh, can we, you know, actually reproduce uh, something similar to what you see in brain from uh, patient brains? Uh, and here, you know, uh, this uh, 2019 paper uh, from Shira's lab uh, showed their, you know, uh, in their hands when they try to make, uh, use heparin, the uh, anionic cofactor, right, to, to fibrilize tau, and in this case, this is uh, 2N4R tau. So it's a single isoform, four uh, repeat domains. Then they get a polymorphic situation. Uh, they, they see, you know, basically different width uh, variation for some of the fiber, different curvature for sure, uh, and crossover length is different. So they picked out about four uh, morphologies, snake, uh, twister, hose, etc., and they resolved um, three out of fours, uh, four morphologies, to high enough resolution, as shown here, they are in these uh, cryo-EM structures. Uh, and these uh, three related structures all have roughly the same, uh, you know, beta sheet residues, but the difference, as you can see, uh, appears at this corner, this, this turning point of these otherwise sort of U-shaped or hairpin-shaped uh, molecules. 
Uh, and uh, so there's definitely uh, some uh, these molecular level conformational disorder that match uh, matches the the ultrastructural level morphological uh, disorder. So this uh, you know uh, makes it tricky to answer the question on how much of this in vitro disorder is due to just the subtle the different variations in your sample preparation and how much of that is intrinsic, right? So uh, we would like to uh, pose this question to say, well. Um, if one can obtain highly homogeneous brain-derived tau structures from you know, this complicated environment of the brain, even when your isoforms, tau isoforms are mixed, like in AD or CTE, you have both 3R and 4R. If you can get you know, under those complex conditions very uh, homogeneous structures, then why uh, should in vitro single isoform uh, necessarily give you polymorphism? I, mean, I, I, I think so our hypothesis is that perhaps this is more due to the sample handling than you know actually the molecular level, the structural level uh, inherent propensity. So and we uh, so set out to to work on an in vitro tau. Uh, we chose the zero and four R tau. So you have uh, four repeats, microtubule binding repeats, uh, and there's no uh, internal insert. That's why it's zero N. And we collaborated with Bill DeGrado's lab and specifically a, an excellent postdoc, uh, Haifan Wu, uh, to work on this uh, problem. So Haifan uh, expressed this uh, protein to a pretty good yield uh, and fibrolized it with uh, heparin in the fairly standard sort of literature kind of way. And we see or he, in his hand, he gets about a lag time of about an hour. Uh, and when he did the trypsin digestion to, to figure out the, the uh, protease uh, resistant uh, core, he gets this uh, 268, residue 268 to 340, molecular weight of about uh, 7.6 uh, kilodalton. Uh, and uh, that would match with R2 and R3 repeats of uh, the, the protein. Right? Uh, and uh, so some of the conditions are he you know, used uh, trypsin, uh, digestion, you know, for 30 minutes and pelleted and then got the bending pattern. Uh, and if you look at the uh, TEM images of the fibros, uh, just, you know, after uh, two or three days of fibrization, you see that most of the morphology uh, fibros look pretty straight. A very small percentage of fibros could be called uh, somewhat twisted. Overall, the width is about 13 nanometer. Uh, so this looks very homogeneous, right? And it's uh, pretty different from that uh, Krau Yem uh, structure. I would say this work started in 2018. So um, it came, we, we knew this data, had this data before the, the eLife um, paper. So we, we didn't have any problem with uh, fibro uh, morphologies, uh, heterogeneity, no heterogeneity problem. So we took this sample and analyzed it with solid state NMR. Now, uh, so in solid state NMR, what we do is to examine uh, uh, NMR active nuclei such as carbon-13, nitrogen-15, or proton, uh, uh, we look at the response of these nuclei uh, in the magnetic field, a large magnetic field, uh, in response to radio frequency irradiation. Uh, and what we measure in our spectra are, you know, chemical structure sensitive uh, frequencies, uh, and these frequencies peaks, positions, are also sensitive to the conformation, the three-dimensional structure of the nuclei. Uh, and uh, in order to get high resolution structures, uh, we, and, and spec to have resolved spectra at all, uh, we, we do this magic angle spinning. We put our samples into these cylindrical rotors that are tilted by this magic angle 54.7 degrees. And under that condition, we get high resolution spectrum. And then we conduct the kind of two-dimensional, three-dimensional correlation spectroscopy that uh, is also very common in, in solution state. Now, what is very nice about solid state NMR uh, or NMR in general is that you can actually uh, carry out these experiments under conditions uh, that uh, you can selectively look at the rigid or immobilized portion of your protein, immobilized residues in your tau fibro. Uh, and uh, you can also separately uh, run experiments to choose to look at dynamic uh, system, dynamic residues, uh, by different ways of exciting the nuclear spins. And so we can have a heterogeneous, dynamically heterogeneous sample, and we can choose to look at the beta sheet core, rigid core, 
in one experiment and switch completely to look at you know, the opposite, the dynamic uh, fuzzy code. And so shown on left uh, is the 2D carbon-carbon correlation spectrum done uh, in a way, spin diffusion correlation spectrum done in a way to selectively look at the most rigid portion of our you know, 4 r tau uh, heparin uh, in vitro fibrolyze. And you can see if you zoom in, to a specific region of the spectrum, the serine region, you can count about 10 peaks. Now there are 12 serine residues in the sort of the, mic the four microtubule binding repeats. So already just from peak counting, uh, we know that we have a single set of confirmation, a single confirmation, a single set of uh, chemical shifts uh, and not some kind of uh, heterogeneous system with multiple peaks per residue, all right? Uh, and if we go to another region of the spectrum where we know the cysting uh, residues will typically show cross peaks. Uh, these are, you know, C alpha, C beta cross peaks of cysteine, and there are only two cysteine residues uh, in the full length uh, tau, uh, cysteine 322 and cysteine 291. And you, even without further more um, sophisticated 3D experiments, these are unambiguous to be cysteine. And the fact that you see two means, again, that uh, there's a single uh, molecular conformation. So that's very nice. Uh, and if you now switch to solution-like experiments where you directly excite the most, the signals, uh, the uh, magnetization of the most um, uh, dynamic residues, then you get this kind of toxic or inept HSQC spectrum. And here, the number of peaks is, you know, not that high. Uh, and basically, uh, each peak is a residue, a type of residues, whether it's glutamic acid or Q. Uh, and so, the, and these frequencies, uh, chemical shifts, uh, correspond to a random coil, coil, more or less random coil uh, chemical shifts. And uh, we can also overlay our solid state spectrum, in this case, a proton nitrogen correlation spectrum done in a way to uh, selectively look at that dynamic residues. And you can uh, compare the black uh, peaks position, solid state spectrum, with the previous uh, uh, published solution NMR spectrum of uh, 4R tau protofibro. Uh, so these red dots are the chemical shift positions measured by Markus uh, Zweckstetter's lab uh, about uh, 10 years ago. And you can see that uh, the peak positions or chemical shift positions match really well. So uh, as far as the uh, most dynamic uh, sort of fuzzy coat portion of the protein goes, the average uh, uh, random coil conformation is very similar whether you have 4R, 0R, 2N4R. All right, so now we then focus on the, the rigid beta sheet core, uh, which is something that we can really uh, look at very specifically by uh, solid state NMR. And here, the challenge, of course, is uh, to resolve all the signals for that rigid um, uh, portion, uh, about 80 something residues. And uh, when we started the assignment process, we actually one, were we're not uh, actually aware of the trypsin digestion result. And so we were doing the assignment in a very independent manner uh, without uh, you know, being uh, influenced by Haifan's uh, trypsin digestion result. Uh, and uh, you know, Aurelio Dragni uh, and Shiva Mandela in my uh, lab together um, overcame, overcame this uh, pretty high challenge of assigning about 80 residues for this beta sheet region of this gigantic protein. I mean, the whole thing is 40 kilodalton. Uh, you know, 383 residues. Uh, and so the sensitivity, right, what you have in the rotor, only a small portion actually corresponds to the beta sheet core and is giving you the signal. And so here uh, they uh, conducted three 3D correlation experiments, all correlating nitrogen signals in the backbone with the C alpha and the CO and the side chains. Uh, and these experiments together basically allow you to walk from one residue to the next in a sequential way uh, and to assign the resonances, to pick out, you know, for example, uh, you know, this uh, uh, hexapeptide motif you have at the R2 domain dating 275, go on to Q276, uh, and etc. So these three experiments shown color-coded here um, allow you to walk from one resonance, uh, one residue's peaks uh, to the next. Uh, and I just want to, you know, in these very uh, dense and busy spectra, I just want to highlight a couple of these, uh, you know, these two cysteines, C291, C322, in their corresponding spectral regions, uh, you can see pretty clearly that it's just really a single set of uh, peaks consistent with a 2D result. So, so it's important to always keep an eye on, you know, this conformational uh, homogeneity aspect and these 3D spectra bear out the 2D. Um, some of the strongest peaks are seen 
for the two hexapeptide motifs in the beginning of R2 and in the beginning of R3, so the second and the third microtubule binding uh, repeats. And so after about uh, three or four months of uh, pretty um, intense you know, assignment, uh, uh, Aurelio and Shiva are able to uh, get uh, this uh, secondary, uh, these chemical shifts for R2 and R3. And you can see based on how these chemical shifts differ from the well-known random coil uh, chemical shift values, we can deduce uh, where the beta strands are. And so you can roughly um, assign about six uh, beta strand segments uh, in between they're either information is missing, not assigned, or we know they're pretty sure that they are, you know, not beta sheet because they are the, you know, PGGGG motif that uh, appears several times uh, in this protein. So, um, so we have six um, beta strands and it, they're all in the R2, R3 and a little bit sticking out into uh, the R4. Now, so we, they assigned about 66 residues and the strongest peaks lie in R2, R3. That's fully consistent uh, with the trypsin digestion result that our collaborator uh, got. Now, these uh, beta strand positions or segments, uh, you know, differ from the crowd yen, uh, snake, uh, twister, uh, jagged, you know, beta strand positions. And you can see uh, the solid state NMR data on the zero and four R, right? You know, for example, we'll put a beta strand here into the R4, and that's not the case for the crowd yen result. And so just there's, there are various uh, differences. Now, we also took a look at um, comparison of the chemical shift of our full length 0 and 4 tau with the truncated tau that has been studied actually by uh, several uh, NMR groups. Uh, Adam Langer and Mark Baudis early on looked at this truncated K19. And of course, at the time, you know, without uh, additional information, they chose this, uh, you know, segment that is falls a little bit short. Uh, compared to what's now known to be the AD core, how long it needs to go. And uh, you can see, uh, you know, that the full length for our Tau's chemical shifts differ quite a bit from the truncated, uh, you know, K19 uh, in terms of nitrogen and C-alpha and C-beta, these chemical shift differences are pretty large. So definitely uh, the full length protein behaves, you know, is, is different. The truncated Tau uh, K19 cannot capture the same conformation. Now, uh, so with the chemical shift assignment, it's great, you get a secondary structure. Uh, but if you want to know the three-dimensional fold, you really need to know how these uh, residues that are far apart in the primary sequence, the amino acid sequence, um, you know, actually come together or fold, right? So, you, so to get that uh, three-dimensional fold information, you really need to measure long-range contacts. Uh, and uh, so here, uh, Harrison Wan, a, a fantastic undergraduate student uh, in my lab, worked with Aurelio uh, pretty closely uh, and, you know, really looked through in detail several 3D spectra, 3D carbon-carbon-carbon correlation, uh, 3D NCACX, uh, where we use very long mixing times, carbon spin infusion mixing times, to try to find long range contacts and what we mean you know what, what can you know how long can we see how far can we see by carbon spin diffusion you can get to about uh, eight angstrom or so uh, when you apply uh, you know a weight mixing time of about 500 milliseconds so after a lot of detailed analysis uh, they're able to find two types of long range contacts about 14 peaks so we're you know very confident because uh, these uh, contacts uh, two types of contacts are reinforced by multiple cross peaks. And as you can see, for example, uh, one set of contacts connect residues uh, in the middle of the R2 domain about, you know, residue, for example, 292 glycine, um, to the beginning of the R3 domain, about 309, right? That's, that's the hexapeptide motif of R3. All right, and you uh, can verify that information from additional cross peaks such as serine 293, again, middle of R2 to the beginning of R3, so Q307. Now, the second set of cross peaks link um, the beginning of R2, such as Q276, you know, here, with the middle of uh, R3, so serine 320. So that's why I draw these two uh, connectivities. Uh, and so if you look at this, these connectivities, right, it immediately suggests uh, a hairpin, right? So you, you have to, uh, whatever you do, you have to connect the R2 hexapeptide motif uh, spatially close enough to the middle of the R3, and then the middle of R2 close 
to the beginning of R3. And so the schematic for such a contact is then shown here. So Aurelio uh, did this uh, you know, analysis. Um, and to satisfy all the contacts we see, which are shown here in these red lines, and it's very clear that uh, our first beta strand beta, beta 1 contacts, uh, the beta 5, and our uh, third uh, strand beta 3, where you have that important cysteine, cysteine 291, uh, contacts the beginning of uh, R3, which is our fourth beta strand. So this is the fold. And here there has to be some disorder or, or bend or kink because the two, two uh, sets of contacts are not uh, equidistant. And so there's a few more residues on this side. Uh, and uh, so that is uh, just a schematic. And uh, Aurelio put all our chemical shift constraints, which translate to dihedral angle constraints, as well as these 14 long range contacts, uh, put all these constraints into Explore NIH and did, uh, you know, uh, structural uh, uh, analysis or structural modeling. And this is, of course, uh, low resolution. It's uh, sparse, sparsely constrained. And uh, then, but this uh, calculation actually supports the schematic that we have here. And uh, this uh, low resolution structural model also uh, suggests which uh, residues face um, uh, the uh, or lie in the steric or form the steric zipper uh, face the side chains of the adjacent uh, beta strand. So this beta one, beta five uh, contacts. Um, so so this uh, fold now you can ask well how does this compare with the two N four R cryo EM in vitro uh, fiber right? Um, so the cryo EM uh, result showed polymorphism. Would our data agree with any one of these fold? Uh, and uh, if you look at it, there's some similarities. Um, the beta 1 to beta 5 is shown in orange and green here. So again, this is uh, beta 1 is the beginning of the R2 domain, and beta 5 is the middle of the R3, where you have that second cysteine 322. So this is actually captured in the crown EM structures for all of these uh, three polymorphic structures. And so this part clearly is very robust and stable uh, structure. Where we differ, right, where these structures differ uh, is in this region, the second set. Uh, here, the three uh, crowd EM structures have show a lot of variability. Uh, so they capture, you know, different, and this, this part is disorder, some, is somewhat fuzzy, is not very well seen. And in our hand, when we get a monomorphic uh, fibro, uh, this part is well ordered. Uh, and now if you, uh, you know, uh, step uh, uh, further and uh, compare with in vivo, of course, um, with AD being a, a mixed isoform, both three R4 are tau present, the situation is completely different. Uh, you see that, uh, you know, because in 3R you don't have R2 domain, one cannot even talk about such a, you know, there's no orange uh, segment. Uh, and just to orient you, uh, we sketched the R3 um, big, uh, heptapeptide motif, this uh, magenta line in the same orientation, right? So AD is a completely different thing. But uh, in 2020, right, uh, Sherry's group came out with the CBD, uh, cortical basal degeneration tau's uh, uh, beta sheet core structure. Now this is a, a pure 4R tau. So it is actually the same chemical species, isoform, as what we are studying here by solid state NMR. And you can see that the resemblance to our in vitro structure now is much closer. Uh, they, they, have the problem, they have the structure starting also from you know, the beginning of R2, and you go on to the R3, <clears throat> and you come back to, uh, so, the, uh, three, so the turn here is 305. And so basically this R2, R3, hairpin or U-shape, whatever you want to call it, uh, is preserved between our in vitro structure and, and uh, the in vivo CBD. Now, we don't know enough, we don't have enough constraints to say too much about what happens in R4. Uh, but we know from the solid state data, there's a further beta sheet. We just don't, can't tie it down in terms of long range contacts very well. Now, if you look at the CBD fold, then they go on to the R4 and it folds this way. So qualitatively, there is actually uh, some agreement. So this gives uh, me uh, quite a lot of confidence that one can actually uh, in vitro, uh, if you do it carefully, uh, you know, produce, um, conformational folds that are actually uh, you know, similar to what happens in vivo. Now, um, Haifan is very reproducible in his fibro formation. And uh, you know, so, so uh, I put out some of the details, uh, what's the concentration of tau he used uh, in making fibros, what is the molecular weight distribution of heparin, 
uh, and heparin concentration, and just compare with the 2N4R uh, crown EM study. Of course, there's uh, some variation. The salt, uh, the buffer used is different. And so if you uh, think about electrostatic static effects, there might be some uh, you know, effects uh, or difference. Uh, everybody does this fibrillization at high pH or neutral pH. And uh, so that part is also pretty similar. So, uh, so if you want to know why, you know, here there are several forms and we didn't have that issue. Uh, that is a puzzle, right? Uh, we all know in the lab, uh, biochemistry can, can vary quite a bit with, uh, you know, your condition. Uh, but interestingly, after we finished most of these solid state MR analysis, uh, Haifa made another batch. Uh, and for a reason that was not clear for about one week. He found uh, in his TM images something very similar to what uh, the, the, the 2N4R uh, paper showed. He also started seeing, you know, I saw this uh, hose and twister and snake matched really well with this uh, result. So we were very puzzled. And, uh, but Haifan took a one week and did a really uh, fantastic detective work and figured out what's, what's the issue. So normally, before you make fibros in the gel, you see a very nice single band corresponding to the full length uh, tau. Uh, and uh, in the way you normally make, uh, you know, then apply, you know, heparin for several days, you should be getting uh, still a single band after fibro formation, single band for the whole thing. And then you do trypsin digestion, you should get a single band for the predominant, uh, the trypsin resistant form. But he switched actually heparin. He ran out of the old heparin and, and bought a new one. And it turns out that heparin, uh, you know, uh, has some protease uh, contamination. And so he found that after, after fibro formation, he got like multiple uh, bands even before applying trypsin. And uh, well, if you have already fragments of protein, then you apply trypsin uh, digestion, you will get multiple uh, fragments. And so, so basically this is uh, a proteolytic fragments of tau that occur during fibro formation due to contaminated heparin or maybe other things in your solution. And so this, uh, the, the, to fix this, he simply added protease inhibitor cocktail. And then the problem went away. And so then he can you know, regenerate pretty straightforwardly, just with a little bit of protease inhibitor, the normal straight morphology. So this is just a, a really uh, less big lesson that uh, you have to be careful uh, to insist on seeing, you know, unfragmented, pro using unfragmented uh, protein to actually uh, form fibers. Now, um, so with that sorted out, we um, also can uh, <clears throat> focus on thinking about the dynamics of this protein. After all, the, uh, you know, this uh, protein, the rigid core is really about uh, only 75 residues or so, which is about 25% of the protein, uh, what happens to the rest. And here, uh, solid state NMR, uh, and actually solution NMR. NMR is just really a good way to look at protein dynamics. Uh, and we can see that when we increase the, the uh, experimental temperature, some of the peaks intensities get weaker, and that's a sign that those residues are you know, somewhat dynamic. Uh, and uh, so just based on peak intensities, we can already tell that um, beyond R2, R3, which is our most rigid beta sheet core, if you start to go into R1 and R4 repeats, their signals are weaker, so they, we call them semi-rigid. They still do show up in the solid state NMR spectra, so they're not extremely uh, dynamic. They're just somewhat uh, mobile. Now you can uh, look at uh, the increasing residues with increasing mobility with other experiments. Uh, so. Uh, if you go uh, N terminal to the R1, you have these uh, pretty important proline rich domains, right? Uh, and we can selectively emphasize these proline signals um, uh, in the uh, NMR spectrum by uh, starting our magnetization from mobile side chains and then transfer uh, that as mobile side chain signals and see what happens. So basically, we're now uh, detecting a subset of the rigid uh, signals that are sort of in close contact with uh, dynamic residues. And by that mobile side chain contact selection, we see proline signals being emphasized. And if you then go on to measure these proline signals, uh, dynamic order parameters, you find that their order parameters range from 0.2 to 0.6. So it's really an intermediate kind of mobility. So that's, that's really interesting. Uh, so we call these proline rich domains semi-mobile. Uh, and then they're really a solution-like toxy type of spectrum where the line width is just super narrow. Uh, and these, we call it uh, basically isotropically uh, mobile. So that's uh, our uh, mobility bar for the uh, protein. Uh, and uh, uh, so to put all these uh, together, uh, we have a rigid core 
that encompass R2, R3 with this fold that is now basically uh, reproduced or consistent with the CBD for our tau in vivo. Uh, and the rest of the protein is not just a monolithically dynamic you know, uh, region, but is actually has an interesting uh, mobility gradient. Right. So um, now uh, you might ask, looking at this uh, kind of schematic, well, if you're a beta sheet core surrounded by other proteinaceous uh, material, uh, can you tell that or verify that by you know, uh, looking at the water uh, uh, exposure of these proteins? Now, water is something that my group has been uh, interested uh, for a long time because uh, it's actually a very good way to selectively detect uh, protein signals that are dry or wet depending on how you run the experiment. So we have uh, used water magnetization transfer to proteins as a way to uh, think about uh, the three-dimensional fold of the protein, as well as to just figure out where in this very large protein and fiber, where the water pockets are. And so we have done this before for A beta 40, uh, and also a de novo designed small amyloid fiber where we can sort of distinguish between steric zipper residues, which you know, should be dry, as well as the wet in, uh, water facing residues. And we use this kind of uh, experiments where we start uh, with the water magnetization and then transfer to the protein. All right, so we, we did that, uh, this type of experiments. Uh, it's a 2D correlation, carbon carbon correlation spectra. Was, this will be the full uh, collection of signals for the solid, uh, you know, rigid sample, uh, rigid uh, residues or the serings. And then if you start just with water to edit your uh, spectrum, selectively detect those residues that are close to water, then a much smaller subset of uh, signals uh, show up. And then you can, you know, divide the intensities to get a sense of the hydration gradient, which residues are wet, uh, shown in blue, which residues are relatively dehydrated, shown in more red colors. Uh, and we can, uh, superimpose this kind of water transfer onto different uh, correlation uh, spectra, whether it's CC or NC, it's the same uh, principle. So with this kind of uh, data uh, as analyzed by uh, Proudhon in my lab, we found that we can, uh, you know, verify that actually the uh, residues at the external facing, um, uh, facing the ex exterior of the hairpin, the R2, R3 hairpin, are all relatively dry. Their magnetization, they, they, they have uh, very little uh, water transfer. But there are two interesting serine residues, 285 here in uh, this position, and uh, serine 316. These residues show up pretty well after water transfer. So we think that there is a, a small water pocket in this region. So this is of interest uh, because, you know, if uh, any of these uh, fibro cores actually have, uh, are spacious enough, contain these pockets, then those might be the place to have uh, small molecule drugs or imaging agent that could go in, right? So, uh, so with that, I would like to actually uh, switch to um, a second story. So um, in all our studies of tau, all the, you know, tau structures, as well as A beta 40 structures, uh, what is always found is that all these um, cross beta fibros are parallel in register hydrogen bonded. So uh, in the previous um, pictures that you see here, I don't, I don't, you can't sketch the third dimension uh, into the plane easily, but uh, these are all uh, beta strands in parallel in, uh, and packed into molecularly. Um, and uh, now, uh, whether that's always necessarily the case, uh, nobody has an example of really an anti-parallel situation. Uh, and uh, in contrast to these neurodegenerative uh, proteins, beta sheet proteins, which usually, uh, well, can be pretty large, uh, small peptides can also fibrolize. And these small, uh, as we all know, and small peptides uh, actually uh, can, can have a significant biological relevance. Uh, so glucagon and insulin uh, can both uh, fibrolize. Um, and both these uh, peptides are, you know, peptide hormones that are important for your blood uh, glucose level uh, uh, homeostasis. Uh, and, uh, and insulin, of course, reduces the blood sugar level, while glucagon does the opposite, and uh, it raises the blood sugar level. So it is an important molecule to treat uh, diabetic hypoglycemia. Now, in healthy people, you produce glucagon, so if your sugar level is low, this uh, glucagon will uh, act. Uh, but in diabetic hypoglycemia, this uh, glucagon formulation uh, as uh, typically, you know, is in this formulation, is actually used to treat this kind of emergency hypoglycemic uh, shock. Uh, now, glucagon is a small peptide, uh, small peptide, uh, and the reason it's formulated in this way, while well, you see um, this uh, uh, 
it's, a, it's uh, formulated as a dry powder, only a milligram or so. And you're supposed to, uh, and it's, it's uh, then mixed with uh, lactose. And then you're supposed to mix with acidic solution, really acidic, less than pH uh, three, uh, very quickly, uh, and then inject it to the uh, patients uh, under hypoglycemic uh, shock. And the reason that this formulation is such is that um, uh, glucagon is only stable uh, at, um, well, it's, it's uh, only soluble at low pH. Uh, but if you want to keep it in low pH solution for long, well, it, it crashes out, it aggregates very quickly. And so this is an example of a pharmaceutical peptide aggregation problem, which is actually uh, very common. Uh, and uh, glucagon was discovered uh, as a peptide hormone, was known since 1923. The aggregation problem uh, was known since 1969. And for about uh, 50 years, uh, there was no good solution uh, you know, um, to, to address this. And in order to use it uh, for pharmaceutical you know, application, you have to apply it at a pretty high concentration, so about one milligram per mil. And so we teamed up with Booker to figure out just what exactly is the you know, acidic pH fibro uh, structure uh, under pharmaceutical conditions of above one milligram per mil. And so here, uh, Kate Smith at uh, Merck conducted these uh, initial biophysical characterization just to show that uh, if you look at the CD spectrum that, you know, after just a few hours, uh, the, this uh, signature goes from a something which is random coil very quickly to the beta sheet signature. And then if you wait a few days and uh, grow the fibros and, you know, just put it onto the TEM grid, you see this very nice homogeneous and uh, straight uh, fibros. Uh, so so um, this is consistent with various literature paper. So we took a look at uh, the glucagon fibro structure by solid state NMR, and these are all chemically synthesized peptide. This is a, a short peptide, um, uh, 29 residues, and we just had uh, various residues uh, labeled uh, site specifically with C13 and 15. Uh, and you can see just from the initial set of 2D correlation spectra, you know, very clean, uh, we can see two sets of chemical shifts uh, for uh, individual residues, serine 11, a T29, and if you switch to nitrogen carbon, the same thing. And you can assign these to amino acid type uh, as well as site-specific uh, label residues because we don't label that many and per sample, and so it's very easy to assign. And so this is really immediately tells you, even though the fiber looks wonderfully homogeneous, that there are two molecular conformations in these fibros and they're both beta sheet uh, because the chemical shifts is unquestionably, unquestionably uh, beta sheet. So, so Marty uh, Gilente, my lab, you know, did and uh, measured all of these, uh, about uh, five or six different uh, labeled uh, peptides and collected or assigned all of these chemical shifts. And you have to be pretty uh, careful to sort uh, which um, come from a one, come from a two, which peaks, uh, which chemical shifts go with which form. Uh, and when the chemical shift differences are clear, uh, large, uh, for you know, each residue between the two forms, then by sequential assignment, you can sort out form one, form two easily, red and blue. Uh, but you can see when you look at the shift difference, when you get to the middle of this uh, peptide, the shift difference between form one and form two uh, is not so large. And so you have to be careful. And here we sorted out which one is which by making sure, uh, by going uh, with the long range contact. So if we have the N terminal half residues and the C terminal half residues showing cross peaks in long mixing spectrum, then we know they belong together. So in this way, uh, we make sure we don't switch uh, form. So, but regardless, both forms are beta sheet and we looked very hard to see, you know, if there is any sort of disorder in the middle because as a 29 residue uh, peptide, you wouldn't start by assuming that they would be a, you know, a single, it would be a single uh, straight beta strand. Uh, you would expect something, a turn or, or disorder in the middle, uh, but we couldn't tell from the chemical shift. Now, so you go, well, how do the two conformers would uh, pack in space? Uh, well, one of the earliest uh, 2D uh, spectra that we measured showed us a very nice uh, cross peak without actually using very long mixing. We can already tell that there is a serine eight to valine 23 contact, right? So now these residues are, these two, uh, two residues are 15 residues apart. Uh, so it's a long range contact that would immediately suggest one of two possibilities. Well, either you have a hairpin of some sort uh, or U-turn, right? And, or you have intermolecular uh, packing that would position the N-terminal half or stack it against the C-terminal half. 
right? So you will sketch these possibilities. And the way you will sort out these is by diluting the sample. So if you mix, you know, labeled with unlabeled samples, if the intramolecular contact scenario is correct, you would expect these uh, cross peaks to remain with the same kind of intensities. But if intermolecular contact is the key, is the, the story, then you would expect intensity to drop. And the second scenario is what we saw. We saw this intensity drop completely. And so it's intermolecular anti-parallel stacking. Uh, well, that's uh, not enough. Uh, so we see a lot of the uh, uh, long range contacts um, between the first half and the second half, N terminal half and C terminal half of uh, the, the peptide. And so that's uh, shown here um, in this uh, anti-diagonal. Now, even with anti-parallel stacking, you could still sketch actually two uh, scenarios. One is, uh, maybe they're stacked in the through the side chain. So you have two beta sheets that they're anti-parallel. But within each beta sheet, you might think that they're still hydrogen bonded in the parallel in register way, as is the case for almost all um, cross beta fibers known so far. Uh, and alternatively, it could be that the two pe the peptides are really anti-parallel hydrogen bonded within each beta sheet. Now, how do you tell these two scenarios apart? Well, it turns out that uh, if it's anti-parallel hydrogen bonded then you would expect the C-alpha and C-alpha carbons on different strands uh, to have their H-alpha, H-alpha protons to be really close uh, through these hydrogen bonds. While if you have a side chain stacking situation, then you don't have that close H-alpha, H-alpha contact. Uh, and instead, uh, you should have side chain, you know, uh, maybe valine methyl and so on, cross peak, uh, talking to the next residue side chain. Uh, so here we did an experiment that specifically look at H alpha, H alpha contacts as manifested by carbon carbon cross peaks. And you see how these serine 8, valine 23 signals are even stronger than the previous regular 2D CC. So it's a, a positive proof that it's anti parallel hydrogen bonding. So, uh, so this was a really big surprise, uh, and we verified it with you know, additional experiments. Uh, and so you go, well, if it's anti parallel hydrogen bonded, then what could, what would be the reason for? us to have two molecular conformations, right? Two sets of chemical shifts and what breaks the symmetry. Uh, and here, the answer to this question came from our exact water uh, study. And so here, again, we transfer water magnetization to the protein and just look at, you know, which uh, residues are well hydrated and show up uh, and get good intensities. And here's where we realize that the two sets of signals respond differently. This conformational two, conformation two, the conformer two, uh, have the odd number of residues such as T5, T7 showing up really well, so they're well hydrated. Uh, while the conformer one uh, puts the even number of residues such as serine eight to be well hydrated. So they have opposite hydration response. And so this allows us to sketch this structure, structural model, where we have the blue, a conformer two, putting their uh, odd number of residues out facing water, and conformer one shown in red put their even number residue uh, facing out. So, so each then have, you know, at least uh, uh, an interior steric zipper, but what faces the dry steric zipper is different. So here's the uh, join that uh, indicates the, uh, emphasize the steric zipper. So there's an even odd residue uh, switch. So this is um, now with further uh, structure calculation using Cyanamardi Marty is able to get a high resolution structure. Uh, and basically the, the uh, the symmetry of the problem is that you have a dual conformation, anti-parallel hydrogen bonded cross beta fibro. Uh, so in each, you have, and, and the basic uh, unit is you have at least two beta sheets encompassing a dry steric zipper and the opposite running direction of the strand also have opposite facing even odd residues. And uh, here's just another view for conformal one and two. So two starts from N to C in this, uh, to the right and conformal one runs the opposite direction and they put different residues into the steric zipper. And so, uh, so this is uh, the structure we got from one, uh, at about 1.7 angstrom resolution from uh, lots of NOEs. Uh, and then the question is, why would this peptide form this very interesting, complicated, uh, even odd steric zipper interface? Uh, well, we think the reason is the glucuron sequence has very few, relatively few hydrophobic residues and there's no consecutive hydrophobic patch unlike uh, a beta. Uh, and instead, you have a lot of very diverse polar residues, such as threonine, serine, and asparagine, and D, aspartic acid. Uh, you have Q, you have, uh, and then you have uh, six aromatic residues, tryptophan, uh, tyrosine, phenylalanine, and then six uh, charged residues. 
Uh, out of this 29 residue peptide, there's only six hydrophobic uh, residues. And if you look at this basic unit of dimer, dimer four uh, molecules coming together, so now this gets a little bit busy. Uh, we try to show it uh, in you know, different pers uh, multiple perspectives to show what could stabilize such a structure. You can see that by having anti-parallel stacking, uh, you create various pockets of really stabilizing interactions, such as this tryptophan 25 to phenylalanine 6 aromatic bops. Uh, and in the middle of the peptide where you have an arginine 18, and you might think that that cationic, you know, electrostatic repulsion is unfavorable. Well, this anti-parallel strand of, uh, we'll put a tyrosine 13 right next to it. So you have a cation pi interaction. Uh, and then if you go to the termini, you have a Q3 stabilizing N28 uh, through hydrogen bond in the side chain. Uh, so, so there are various um, really nice weak interactions that can, you know, stabilize this, this interesting structure. Now, glucagon in its functional form is not, uh, clearly not a beta strand. Uh, and in fact, early on, uh, so in the 1980s, Kurt Vujic's lab used solution NMR to study glucagon and found it to be largely uh, disordered, intrinsically uh, disordered, uh, unstructured. And um, in, uh, then in 2018, very recently, uh, glucagon as bound to its receptor, glucagon uh, receptor in the membrane has been solved by crystal structure and you see uh, glucagon itself is completely alpha helical. Uh, and uh, back in the 1970s, uh, there is a crystal structure of moderate concentration glucagon and it's also helical. So you can, uh, depending on the concentration in, you know, uh, you, you get different forms. Now, if you get to the pharmaceutical application level of milligrams per, per mil, uh, then you get our, you know, beautiful intriguing uh, beta sheet uh, structure. So here's a, you know, uh, animation uh, we made to depict this, you know, the many phases of glucagon. Uh, we think that uh, dilute concentration is disordered, but when it sees its receptor in the membrane, then you have an alpha helical uh, functional uh, form. Uh, and in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what happens if you have starting, if you start to have a moderate concentration of glucagon, you have a coil to helix uh, transition. Uh, and this transition puts multiple molecules in a parallel fashion in the trimer uh, crystal structure. Now you might think, well, if I keep adding, if I keep uh, increasing the concentration, how would this trimer possibly go into, you know, a beta sheet uh, across beta fibro? So this is our imagination. We have no data and nobody has any data, but uh, we imagine that these multiple trimeric uh, helical bundles would just start to dissociate, but they still keep the trimer form. But if you have multiple uh, trimer coming in opposite directions, then the molecules can intercalate and start to pick up from the ends through these favorable, you know, Q3, N28, hydrogen bonding or aromatic box and start to zip up uh, into uh, the beta strand form under very high concentrations in solution. So, um, so I'll, I'll just uh, conclude here and say that um, for tau, we believe that in vitro, it is possible to get biologically you know, relevant confirmation of the fibro. So that opens up the possibility to study the structure function relationship uh, and uh, that is not limited by sample amount. And glucagon presents the first case of an anti-parallel hydrogen bonded uh, beta sheet that tells us some of the fundamental structural principles uh, of uh, beta sheet formation. So with that, uh, I would really like to acknowledge Aurelio, who uh, really spearheaded um, this uh, the set of uh, um, uh, the Tao, Tao study in my group, and Marty uh, Gilente in my lab is the principal, uh, is the leader of the Glucagon story study, and Shiva uh, played a very significant role in the first uh, uh, zero and four Tao study with Aurelio, and Poo and Harrison have uh, contributed significantly since since then in follow up uh, studies. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Xiaomei, for a great talk, um, great work as well. Um, so I, let me start the question. Yep. Is a mobile water, even though they Sorry. are- Sorry, um, I didn't hear the beginning. Can you start maybe over? You, maybe my internet is not stable. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so the water molecules that you see associated with serine residues in yes. tau fibros, how mobile are these water molecules? And is this like a water channel? And do we expect the serine residue to be more dynamic than, more mobile than other residues in the structured region? Uh, 
Um, so I can say uh, this, to the second part, those serum residues that are well hydrated are not more mobile than the other serum residues. We have not characterized, to your first part of your question, we have not characterized the water dynamics that you know, uh, hydrates the, the uh, protein residues. Uh, and it's, uh, there are experiments one can do to characterize the water, but uh, the sensitivity is usually the limitation. And uh, so we have done these uh, analysis of the dynamics of water near the protein for a beta, uh, and also for membrane-bound channels. There's going to be an Influenza B paper coming out, Influenza BM2 paper on this uh, question. It's a very rich uh, biophysical kind of uh, study, but we haven't done it for tau. Yeah. So I imagine that these water mod oh, okay. not imagine, I, I'm pretty sure these water that hydrate that uh, serine 285 and 316 must be running through the whole, you know, fibro. Uh, it can be just a few here and there, because then we wouldn't have the kind of signals that you're seeing. We're, we're really looking at a whole channel, yeah. But it can be just a very tight little pocket or, or, or channel running through. And uh, again, you know, our A-beta study is the one, the first one that gave us that kind of insight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question from Anup. Anup, go ahead, ask the question directly. Uh, uh, hello, Menho. Uh, I had a doubt regarding uh, like how we your water is getting associated with the fibril formation. Like you, when you're doing the solid state NMR, you would be uh, using different sort of rotations for doing the magic angle spinning and etc. Right. Yeah. So uh, will this uh, rotation cause any sort of effect in having this water uh, association with the fibrils? Like, uh, yeah. will it? Yeah. Um, our magic angle spinning speed for these experiments are, um, is generally pretty low. It's at 10 to 14 kilohertz. And that, that kind of spinning speed, I don't expect the uh, uh, water dynamics to be uh, strongly affected. Uh, this is very different from you know, spinning at 60 kilohertz or 100 kilohertz. Now, whatever water magnetization we're picking up is already coming from water molecules that are very close to the protein. It's nothing like bulk water. Right, uh, so so it's got to be immediate and adjacent, and uh, I think the the I I think they're not uh, isotropic. They're partially a little bit, uh, you know, anisotropic. So um, so the spinning speed that we're using doesn't really have uh, uh, the moderate spinning speed we're using doesn't have an impact. Um, so yeah. So we're not having, okay. we're not seeing any any water which kind of separates from the fibro due to the spinning would be out of my uh, spectrum. It couldn't possibly influence the protein signals. Yeah. Okay, fine, fine. Yeah, I just want to clarify that. Thanks. Yeah, we're talking about Enstrom level water content. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Binzu, go ahead, ask your question. Hi, Professor Kong. Uh, I enjoyed your talk. I have two questions. And one for tau, one for glucagon. Yep. So for tau, uh, there are reports uh, saying, uh, you know, the post-translational modification, just, just such as phosphorylation, acetylation, or, uh, you know, other uh, ways may have played a role in terms of uh, fibrillation. Yeah. Uh, have you, in your lab, have you tried any, you know, post-translational modified peptide to see whether they have like a yeah, no, similar... We yeah, no, we haven't. This would be really interesting, of course, but we haven't. This would uh, require a uh, significant additional biochemistry that we haven't got around to do. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think one can, uh, you know, of course, extrapolate to, you know, get some insight about what happens with the uh, protein in vivo when they uh, have uh, post-translational modifications. But as of now, we kind of have to focus on the uh, non-modified in vitro samples, yeah. But this will be something, of course, very interesting to examine in the future, yeah. The, the second question about the glucagon uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, there are uh, some papers saying in vivo, the glucagon installed in alpha cells of the pancreas as uh, fibrils, as a storage. So do you think the glucagon fiber may be reversible? Ah. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, well, it, it, so far, I, I'm not aware of anybody reversing the fibro just by, you know, coming down, reducing the concentration. Uh, and I, the storage in um, the pancreas, uh, that's an interesting question. I'm aware of some other peptide hormones 
uh, in storage having beta sheet uh, form. And in fact, there was a, a very recent, um, I think, a science or nature paper using Qualia looking at one of these storage things. Uh, and there's also a uh, solid state NMR paper on beta endorphin as a hormone that, uh, you know, is stored as a beta sheet. But I'm not, I have not seen any paper that says glucagon is stored as a beta sheet. Uh, and uh, considering that uh, this fibro does not form until at least one milligram per mil, uh, you know, I'm not sure that in vivo it gets to that high. Um, and uh, so I, I will be very curious. I, there are many uh, peptide hormones, as I said, endorphin is one that does happen that way, you know, uh, makes uh, it stored that, that way. So I um, obviously for its function, this is always, this peptide has to be an alpha helix. Um, yeah, that, that part is clear. In, in your in your test, uh, is a uh, glucagon fiber very toxic compared to other fibers? For example, uh, another peptide from the uh, group uh, from pancreas, amylin, is very toxic. Uh -huh. Do you have any comparison with you know other fiber in terms of toxicity, like or a beta forty two something? Yeah, well, that's interesting. Nobody, uh, nobody uh, has actually looked at toxicity. You realize this is a pharmaceutical formulation problem that if it's aggregated, then you cannot inject, you cannot solubilize it to mm -hmm. give to patients. Uh, and um, uh, but whether it has toxicity, you know, uh, to people that I'm not, sh I'm not aware of papers addressing that. Uh, I would just say that uh, if you can keep it soluble, then you know the. Uh, biomedical application is that then one can have an artificial pancreas, right? You can have alternating insulin pump and glucagon pump, uh, and you can just regulate, you know, depending on the blood sugar level, high, low, high, low, right? You know, uh, and that was the ultimate, that would be the ultimate dream. Uh, and insulin currently, you can do it in pump. And it takes several weeks for insulin to eventually crash out. For glucagon, it happens in hours if you keep it in solution. And so that's the goal. I, I'm not aware of toxicity uh, description of glucagon fibrils, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sudeep Tamaiti, go ahead. Hi, that was a beautiful talk. I loved it. Thank Especially you. interesting was your uh, you know, finding that if you do not have 50 days contamination, then you get a single conformer. Mm -hmm. That would tend to suggest that, that there is a real free energy minimum as far as conformers go for the tau. That's right. But then <clears throat> I would presume that you are stating that the fact that we get it from the brain as single conformers also means there are no peptidases or active there. And if so, then how come you have two different conformers from two different individuals? Huh. Uh, well, actually, the, the so far, based on the various cryo-EM uh, structures, uh, multiple patient brains with the same disease have the same conformation. Uh, so multiple AD brains have the same molecular structure. And if you go to CTE, I uh, don't know whether they have done the multiple brain search, but uh, I think, I presume that it is also one disease, one structure, and different disease, different structure. And so there's a clearly a free energy minimum for the brain uh, situation. Now, if you ask what happens if uh, tau in the neuron gets, uh, you know, fragmented by, pro, uh, you know, also proteolized, right? You know, that question, I, I don't know uh, how to address that, you know. So um, there's got to be other biological mechanisms, I guess, to protect tau and keep it in the full length way. That's, that would be my um, guess. I just say a quick thing, if uh, Rams permits me. Go ahead, go ahead, yeah. So even in pigs disease, the tau is different from the uh, other tau pathies. So yes. obviously there are different minima. Yeah. Yes, so one single disease, maybe one single thing, but it's all happening in human brain. And in each case, it is a single conformer coming from one brain. So that yes. means those conformers are very close to each other, right, free energetically. Yes. It's not uh, just a peptidase thing. Uh, it's not just what? What's the last sentence? Uh, if the peptidases were active, uh, you know, if, if the peptidases are not active, yeah. then you don't get a single conformer because you stated that different diseases, you have different conformers. Actually, the same is true for amyloid beta. As Tico has shown, yeah. you get different brains like different conformers. And sometimes the disease nature presentation is different. But that means it's 
not a question. So each brain has one single conformer, but this different brain has a different conformer. So but that's why I contend that as far as we know, Tao actually different brains with the same disease, let's say AD, have the same conformer. But Tao in I realize A beta is different, that's true from Tico's study. But at least based on the Kuai Yan, the I, I you know the, the, they, that's the um, data that I showed here that um, they examined case one case so sixteen cases apparently uh, and this, this is all AD and they get the same confirmer so this is different from A beta yeah I, I I mean this obviously would involve a tremendous amount of work uh, to also examine this for other for PICS disease or CTE or CBD and I, I think they probably haven't done that but uh, so far with the evidence seems like there is a isoform specific confirmation uh, and disease specific confirmation. Yeah. Thank you. Christian. Hi, May. <coughs> um, I'm a little bit dark because he has already um, night. Um, <laughs> I, I was wondering when you started out and this is exactly the right picture. I mean, there was this unidentified density uh, in the um, in the tau fibrils from from Schiris and Gödert, and, and mentioned that also that uh, one of the goals was to maybe identify that, but it seems then from the mobility um, data that that you showed that um, there's not really anything that would qualify for for this for this binding, um, which is probably from other parts of of tau than um, R two R three and maybe the start of R four. So yeah, yeah. Uh, did you look for that in any way? We, um, we don't have enough signals from these partially mobile or uh, partially rigid residues to establish what could be uh, you know, contacting these uh, exterior residues. At least in our 4R uh, tau, you know, we, uh, our model or, or low resolution structural model, uh, you know, don't, we, we stay uh, agnostic so far about what mm -hmm. could be contacting. Now, in the brain, of course, you can have other molecules which our relatively pure in vitro uh, system, you know, does not have. And uh, so I leave that open. I would just say from our data, uh, when you have a relatively pure system, it's clear that this, this core is surrounded by the rest of the protein, which are heterogeneously dynamic. Uh, so um, I think it might be actually hard to fit anything sizable. I, that's my impression. Uh, to these outside regions. And even for the water molecules that we picked out within this portion where the two serines are, you know, I, I don't think it's a large pore at all. You know, so uh, yeah, I think it's a tiny little pore that just gives enough space to have, um, you know, some uh, more uh, water to transfer the magnetization. Yeah, that's this one. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we don't have evidence for any small molecule. Mm. Vijay, go ahead. Hi, May. Um, beautiful talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, quite, a, a, quite an exhaustive work, actually. Um, I, I have two questions. One, uh, both are uh, about Tao. Um, you know, following on the uh, question that Sudipta asked, um, and I'm surprised to see that the Tao um, conformation in, in among sporadic and uh, genetic uh, familial uh, uh, patients are quite similar, which is remarkably different from mammalot beta. My, yes. So my first question is, uh, how do you reconcile that, you know, same 80 patients have different A beta right, right. while um, the tau is the same? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, actually, so the, our glucagon study gave me some uh, insight. I think it really depends on the hydrophobic versus hydrophilic residue distribution in your primary sequence. Uh, we know Tau's amino acid sequence is actually quite diverse, and you have a lot of charged residues at the end terminus. It's uh, acidic and you know negatively charged in the middle. You have a lot of positively charged residues, uh, and and the C terminus it's negatively charged again. I think when you have a polar kind of amyloid protein where the stable uh, structure is not held together by predominant hydrophobic residues, then you get a relatively defined molecular conformation. I think A beta, as you know, A beta sequence is highly hydrophobic for that, you know, hairpin mm -hmm. U-turn. And uh, you see how uh, glucagon here, uh, you know, it, uh, 
I mean, ultra structurally is completely homogeneous, right? And just likes to uh, intercalate in this uh, interesting way, in the anti parallel way. So I, I think it's a, a polar versus non polar interaction that's the key. Hmm. Yeah, okay. and there seems to be uh, emerging data. I think uh, Tico's recent FUS protein uh, work has some echo, uh, echo some of that. Mm -hmm insight. Uh, the, when they looked at the end terminal half of foods versus the full lens foods, foods yeah. uh, they get, you know, the same core, uh, but the C terminus half of the, the uh, beta sheet core does something different. And, and so I think you have to really look at amino acid sequence and uh, yeah. And the, the second question is, uh, have you looked at um, the hyperphosphorylated form of tau versus the uh, non-phosphorylated. Right. Do you see any differences uh, in the structures we, of the fibers? We haven't. This this would be you know very interesting. Uh, we haven't gotten to that. Uh, these these uh, full length. Uh, so the, the first thing we we're doing is to benchmark the situation, the structure, the fold, the dynamics at the just the pure protein without phosphorylation level. Uh, and uh, so for our, you know, zero and four R is 40 kilodalton. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at zero and three R, it's only slightly smaller. So these are gigantic proteins to analyze by, you know, solid state NMR. <laughs> and so, but once that is established, then yeah, you know, all of these very interesting aspects of uh, hyperphosphorylation would be, you know, uh, very nice to, to pursue. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Wonderful work. So maybe there's one question not answered in the Q&A folder. Can you, can you look at that? Um, what is the meaning of 1.7 angstrom resolution for a solid state NMR structure? Could you address that? Yeah, um, so this is uh, 1.7 angstrom describes the um, low, uh, 10 or 20 lowest energy structures in your ensemble. Their uh, root mean square uh, deviation of the heavy atom. Okay, so so that's that's what we mean. So it's a pairwise RMSD for all the molecules in our deposited structure. Now, um, it does not mean necessarily that the disorder. If I show, I, I have some images showing the disorder for some residues, uh, and that does not necessarily mean that uh, the that particular residue is really dynamically disordered or showing a distribution a of structure in your sample. It could just mean that we don't have enough constraints. And so we have to leave it open. Uh, so it's the unknowability, not necessarily uh, truly disordered. So, so yeah, but the uh, one point in, in most NMR structures that you see, this Enstrom resolution refers to uh, pairwise RMSD. And we usually just quote the heavy atom. We don't just quote, uh, you know, it's not back backbone, it's heavy atom including side chains. So for glucagon, um, the, the aromatic residues, tryptophan, 25, you know, we have fewer cross peaks. So that part in the structure calculation, I mean, it can only take all the NOEs you give it, right? Uh, and so it says, okay, occasionally it could be pointing this direction for the indoor ring, right? So, so you have to leave that open, yeah. Okay, let's close the formal session by thanking me for a great talk and the participants as well. So let's go to the informal session. Um, feel free to ask questions. If you raise your hand, we can promote you to the panel. So may I have a question. So in your experiment, you transferred the magnetization from mobile residue to the rigid one to find out the U-turn, uh -huh. right, the beta turn, right? Yeah. So um, when you go from that, I saw that you have the filter and then you got a CP. I remember in your pulse sequence. Uh, so okay, so, so let me, um, so you're talking about the proline rich data, right? Proline rich uh, region. Uh, is that what it is? I, I thought you were looking water? for. Yeah, you... yeah, that's right. That's right. You're right. You are right. Yeah. So yeah. when you uh, when you, you transfer the magnet session from mobile region to what do yeah. you do? You transfer the region. Well, so we, we select the um. Uh, yeah. We do a yeah. excitation at one point five ppm, where you have a lot of mobile side chain, you know, methyl right. group signals. So you transfer then, via scalar coupling. Uh, no, uh, spin diffusion. So it's actually okay. you know, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. So it's dipolar. And then we detect and we see which residues uh, pick up are, are close to these mobile side chains. And uh, so then you uh, pick up these, uh, a lot of these proline signals, so 48 ppm or here you have some proline contribution. And so then we measure whatever we, we get, we measure the, uh, you know, the um, uh, order parameters by dipshift. And so uh, this is the reason we uh, say that the proline rich uh, region is uh, semi-mobile. Now, I didn't mention too much this particular spectrum. This is a 2D 
carbon-carbon correlation after we transferred from the mobile side chains. And here it's very funny. How so long is, um, how long is the spin diffusion time there? Uh, okay, the spin diffusion time is nothing special. It's normal. It's normal, probably 20 to 50 milliseconds. What is special is that after CP, you might think that you have rigid, you know, dipolar coupling, you know, the, the, uh, rigid residues, but we couldn't see spin diffusion. Mm -hmm. The cross peaks are gone. So this is the only time we have this weird combination of residues able to do CP, but not able to do uh, the uh, relayed magnetization transfer via dipolar spin diffusion. So 20 milliseconds is a really long time. Do you see any way intermolecular magnetization transfer happening? And are you able to probe the intermolecular contacts by this mean, by using? I well, intermolecular contacts would require much longer than 20 milliseconds, right? 20 milliseconds is the typical time we use to see intra residue C alpha, C beta, C beta, C gamma cross peaks. But and you're doing protons, protons. So if you have rigid parts, it can go. Well, yeah. here, that's the thing. We don't have it. You oh. see, you know, very little. So that's the odd part, right? Usually you think if I have gotten the magnetization through CP, I should have a spin diffusion cross peaks, and we, we don't. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we think it's this. Uh, you know, weakish uh, 0.2 to 0.6 order parameter that's really killing the cross peaks. Yeah. That's good. So do you, do you expect that uh, spinning speed versus um, water, uh, the question from Anup, um, just revisiting that question. So let's say if you spin it, let's say 100 kilohertz um, at the magic angle, yeah. you can have some dehydration happening, but yes. that shouldn't that shouldn't uh, damage the hy hydrated, structured water in the uh -huh. fire. Uh -huh. It will only leak out, uh, dehydrate the unbound water or loosely yes. bound water, right? Yeah. So ethereum seems to be really uh, nicely bound with water. Water, yeah. water is structured there. I, I, um, this is what I believe, but one would have to look at two experiments to check this out very carefully, uh, because 100 kilohertz spinning has affected membrane proteins. I know from other right. people. Uh, and you get weird uh, structure, you know. Uh, now, membrane samples are very, you know, soft versus fibrils. Fibrils are more robust. Uh, and so my guess would be the bound water should not be affected even if you spin at 100 kilohertz. But I think one, the best way to check this out is by doing slow MAS and compare, right, you know, uh, so. Okay, raise your hands and I can promote you to the panel. So already we have Binzu and Vijay are on the panel. So go ahead, ask your questions. Hi, Dr. Hong. I have a couple of questions, couple more questions about Tao. Yeah. So uh, in, your, yeah, in, your, in your slide here, uh, showing R prime domain, uh, this is about the Tau different domain. So you, in your data, you also show some structure of it. Because some mm -hmm. people, I think, probably report similar thing as like R5, because normally you have R1 right. to R4 yeah. repeating domains. Yeah. But that is actually some extension out there may have also have some structure. Do mm -hmm. you observe that? Well, okay, for uh, based on our assignment, we actually don't go all the way to the R prime. We might have uh, a couple of isolated residues, but uh, I, you know, um, I, I don't have it here in this uh, secondary chemical shift bar chart. So, uh, so we don't want to say too much about it. That, uh, uh, I would just say for the residues that we can assign, the R1, R4 residues, they, their intensities are not strong. And so that's in my, uh, that's here in this, in this uh, um, diagram, right? You know, so here we only stop, we, we stop at R4. So, um, but based on the, the, what we know about P1, P2, which is, you know, definitely semi-mobile, I would project, you know, it's very reasonable to say that this part would be the same. Uh, and uh, the isotropically mobile solution-like peaks come from the really tail ends. And we know that just by staring at, you know, these toxic solution-like spectrum and look at the intensities of, you know, peaks that we can resolve to amino acid type, whether it's alanine or alanine preceding proline and things like that. We can, and then look at the amino acid sequence and say, oh, okay, you know, we have uh, alanines, these are the red bars, and then we have a blue, that means alanine before proline. So we can do this type of uh, intensity matching uh, to, to figure out, okay, indeed, uh, these super dynamic ones reside in the two ends of the protein. Yeah, about 100 residues in N-terminus and uh, a small chunk in the C-terminus, yeah. 
there are also uh, six residues between R2 and R3. The people, a lot of people consider the core of the forming the, this nucleus of a fiber. Do you see anything like a special about that? This called like a hep, heptopeptide between uh, at the end of R2 and at the beginning of R3. Um, so the, the very end of R2 is PGGGG, as you see here. Mm -hmm. uh, and the beginning of R3 is the hexapeptide motif, VQI, VYK. And right. this hexapeptide motif is one of the two sets of signals that are very strong, very rigid in a solid state spectrum. So the other hexapeptide motif is the beginning of R2, VQI, INK. And so that's uh, very clear in our assignment. So, so I'm not aware of, we, we don't know the PGGG residues very well at the mm -hmm. end of R2. Okay, that's not part of the traditional hexapeptide motif, yeah. So there is also N terminal, there are N1 and N2. Uh, can your study reaching that far or it's mostly disordered? Um, N1 and N2 are missing in our sample. So we have a zero N4R construct, so we, uh, don't have the N1, N2. Now, this 0 and 4 r is one of the six isoforms that occur in uh, people's brains. And, uh, uh, and so it actually is even a little bit more common than the f absolutely the longest one, which is 2 and 4 r so, so it is a very meaningful uh, full-length construct to study. Yeah. So we don't, we don't have the N1, N2 in our sample. We, we, yeah. Last short question is about you showing like a six isoform there. Do they have a different kinetics in terms of fibrillation rate? Well, uh, that would require individual studies of you know every one of these six, which uh, we haven't done. Uh, and so, what I can tell you is that in vitro, the three R tau here fibrillizes very differently. Okay, so that that part we know. We, this is unpublished uh, work, uh, but it's um, it's it's a different situation. Yeah. Different meaning like a faster? Slower. Slower, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Vijay, your turn. Well, I actually didn't have any question, but I you know I I, I was I was on the panel panelist list, but I can I can uh, I truly appreciate the work that you've done. I think it's really remarkable. I just have one continuation question. I mean, since Ram has actually given me the platform to ask I'll, I'll do ask that so I basically you 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 pointed out that uh, the um, the hydrophobic core is actually what is uh, directing um, either the fibril to be homogeneous or uh, different structures uh -huh. but if I recall some of the TCO structures of a beta there were very similar interaction between the uh, residues hydrophobic residues but one formed the c2 symmetry over one formed this uh, I think the Griffin structure was three C3 or something like that, or S-shaped uh, symmetry. But they do have this more or less a similar contact. My guess is that this is probably going to lead to a sort of uh, uh, different thermodynamic uh, stability uh, uh, between the two um, symmetric structures. Uh, in principle, I see very similar things could happen with the tau fibril structure that you showed, where the, you have instead of C2s, uh, two Cs coming together forming the fiber, then we have a three of those um, uh, monomeric units could interact to form a C3 symmetry, isn't it? So what what you think is precluding such interactions? Are it if if we yeah. generate a fiber in different and uh, in, in conditions? Yeah. Um, so uh, if one uh, truncates tau and strip away all of these uh, dynamic fuzzy code regions then I think you can really get it into multiple forms. So I think there's a, a protective or energy landscape narrowing effect by the dynamic portion, which is restricting how, much, uh, how many different conformations can be adopted by the central uh, beta sheet core. Uh, and uh, then the um, variability of polymorphism of A beta. I agree, of course, we know that the the same uh, in terms of uh, a U-turn or beta hairpin structure, uh, but there's where you see differences when things slide a little bit, right? You know, uh, and so that I think is really like 
if they're all hydrophobic veilings and isolucines and, you know, glycines, well, you know, what difference, the difference is small when you just, you know, turn, that, that turn part is a little bit different, right? So, uh, and now if you say, okay, A beta 40 can make a three-fold symmetric or two-fold symmetric, well, then it uh, is a matter of um, how different molecules, the three-fold symmetric has kind of a big pocket in mm -hmm. an empty space. And what keeps these different molecules together is the ends, right? You know, that's where, if you recall, um, I, in A beta 40, there's the D23 and uh, yeah. then A28. Well, these are polar residues. Then right. they might have a pretty significant influence on mm -hmm. the, the supramolecular assembly, right, of the mm -hmm. structure. And so this comes back to my contention or hypothesis mm -hmm. that I think these polar residues uh, matter more for achieving a relatively unique or not so polymorphic structure. And whether that's for function or dysfunction, uh, you know, it can be either. But I think in terms of conformational landscape, energy landscape, the polar residues, I believe, uh, is critical. Uh, yeah, I think the, the D to K salt bridge was pretty critical in one of those yes, structures. It's very important. Yeah. And that salt bridge comes and goes in different yeah. forms. And that's the signature, right? And uh, I think in glucagon, well, I should say glucagon, um, I mean, if you change the sample preparation conditions, you also can get different forms. So I don't say it's always rock solid coming out. Yeah. Uh, but I think our um, data Actually, when we got all our chemical shifts and uh, contacts, and we look back at some of the literature studies, there's actually a lot of work uh, on the by you know um, uh, AFM, TEM, other you know good uh, work from uh, uh, Danish and just, uh, um, Swedish groups, uh, and our data could explain some of their early findings. And in fact, there was uh, early um, studies that based on um, to think about this. They also, there was some suggestion about, uh, you know, hair being shaped because um, people, oh, or there was mutagenesis. I, I mm -hmm. think, there was some, you know, if you mute, uh, um, change or uh, uh, mutate the tryptophan 25, that is an important guy, and then phenylalanine 6, if you mutate these guys, then the, the fibros get weaker or, you know, so, so if you take away some of the interactions we now see, the aromatic box, right, yeah. then, you know, you change the situation completely. Uh, and Correct. so, from a more functional assay uh, perspective, people know which residues are important. So they could guess a little bit, um, yeah. So that would be interesting to see about the hyperphosphorylated form because you are going to see a lot of phosphorylations and negatively charged surfaces. How that's going to influence the fibril structure will be very interesting. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. Exactly, for tau, right. Yeah. So indeed, yes. Thank you. Hey, uh, you got now the, this beautiful structure and, and uh, fantastic NMR data. Could you destabilize the other fiber? So could you monitor as you destabilize the fiber or disassociate the fiber and see which part of the protein is uh, getting unstructured? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, can we destabilize? You could provide insight into the mechanism maybe. Right, right. Or maybe we can take your sample just before um, getting final fiber, maybe just as a function of time of its growth. That's a, that's a very good uh, suggestion. Uh, so, right, you know, to capture a state before the fibro completely matures. Right. Yeah, um, indeed, uh, this is something that one should be able to examine by uh, do by solid state NMR. Yeah, um, and uh, I think the trick would be to keep it reproducibly in some form uh, and not uh, have it uh, change. And uh, yeah, I, I think one should be able to uh, do this. So we can, I mean, you know, once we have the basic set of chemical shifts, then- um, You do have it, you have the endpoints. Yeah, yeah, you can now very see how things change, indeed, yeah. No I mean, point you know, in between, yeah. That's true, yeah. That's a good suggestion, yeah. And so uh, let's look at the, the, the topology of your beta sheet structure, your R1, R2, R3, R4 is sticking out. Um, could you could you give us some could you give us some insights into the what is the role of let's say if I chopped off the R four completely, what would I lose in terms of physiological function? Um, it looks like a, a, that 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 hairpin is there, so rest of the rest yeah, looks yeah. like a waste to me. <laughs> Can I just chop it out and see what happens to that? Why do I need it, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. So I would invoke. Uh, with this, I would invoke um, 
the CDD structure, which is four. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You see that it goes on. Now, mm -hmm. if you say, well, uh, in vitro, the the remaining portion is dynamic. I, at least you know we cannot mm -hmm. we cannot see those signals well. And uh, what does it hurt? Uh, Maybe the dynamic portion is there meant to interact with other cofactors, maybe? Or to somehow stabilize the core in some way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so this, um, I think this is one of these things that begs to be done and tried. And uh, because the, obviously the K19, K18 getting a different form is because people cut too short. And so you can say, okay, let's, let's keep a little bit more, you know, uh, and would you get the same form? Uh, there is a good chance that it might be the same form. Uh, but uh, for example, I think, you know, if you cut out the first 100 residues that are truly just solution-like, maybe it really doesn't matter. Maybe it really doesn't matter. Yeah. So this will be uh, one thing to test. Yeah. Okay. The panelists, uh, Magda, Joan, Bikash, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I, I have a, a question. Um, and I really enjoy your work and it's the structures are so beautiful and the glucagon structure is um, so amazing with that very long stretch of uh, beta strands uh, yeah. locking together. Uh, my, my question in regard with, with that structure is uh, usually it's really tough to find. I, I don't know if there's any other structure with that long um, no, right. strand. There's it's, not. There's none. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, that's not none of that. And the reason for like uh, for like the beta strands being a kind of it's a certain length, I, I think, is because no, you you kind of need to them to be straight, but with the time there's imperfections and there is a curvature and bending to it. Yes. So this will propagate when you have to add uh, hundreds and thousands of molecules, yeah. and yet the fibril is uh, a very like very long and straight for glucagon. How you will explain that uh, yeah, yeah. phenomena? Um, it's it's amazing. So. so um, I have a couple of explanations. One is, um, if you look at the uh, chemical shifts, um, I show that the middle part, this chemical shift difference between conformer one and two is getting smaller. Now that's not the same as saying it's a little bit less beta sheet. Uh, we squinted pretty hard to try to find something disordered in the middle. And, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't find it. Uh, but I, um, but whatever it is, the two forms are more distinct at the two ends than in the middle. And then the other thing I would say is what keeps this fibro so, uh, the, the strand so long, we think, and that's why I sketched this, uh, uh, this structure this way, is two critical interactions. One is this uh, tryptophan 25 and phenylalanine uh, 6. Let me just show this one again. And that's one end. And the other end is Q3 and N28. So I think that it's the two sides being very strong and locking the thing together. And it does not allow the middle to do any bending. And then the, the middle is Y13R18. You have a cation pi interaction. So I think, um, you know, if, if you don't have these safeguards for the beta strands to zip up, then indeed, you know, it's kind of not so likely for a molecule to keep on going as a straight strand for so long, for 10 nanometer. Uh, but I think it's kept together through these uh, interactions, aromatic box, hydrogen bonding, uh, so that it could overcome uh, even a little bit of potential barrier to keep going, right? Uh, I would also point out that this low pH aspect is pretty important because this uh, peptide has D, uh, D, D, three Ds, aspartic acids. Uh, and so if you, uh, at, at low pH, no problem, they're all COOH, they're all neutral. So then they happily, you know, can be tugged into the steric zipper interface. But if you go to high pH, uh, they're all charged. So the high pH is a different, you know, uh, situation. The high pH, uh, this uh, peptide um, is not even very soluble. So that's uh, actually the first issue. It's not soluble to begin with, not to say fibro formation, yeah. Um, so, so I think uh, the basically the possible barriers against fibro formation is reduced by having low pH, 
and then the two ends are reinforced into this long strand by these uh, interactions that accumulate to become not so weak. That's my answer, yeah. That's, that's my interpretation of why this will go on for so long. And, and do you think it's possible that uh, you have a slight polymorphism to correct for that while the fibril is extending or your data is really like a two different polymorphs, strictly different. You, you understand, because you have bending at certain time, you can have a slightly different, uh -huh. um, kind of like the next one on a slightly different and just starting yeah. with a slight shift in a confirmation on the steric zipper. Right, um, so I mean, you know, so here uh, the, the TM is pretty, uh, you know, shows very homogeneous ultrastructural morphology. Now you say, well, okay, do we have some disorder on a molecular level? Well, in a way, you can call the two conformers as disorder in a way, right? Uh, right there, there are two molecular conformations, except that we see cross peaks between them. So they're well integrated together. So these two beta strands are intercalated, alternating and so on. And so, so then it is not really disorder anymore. It is really just keeps going and these line width uh, of these peaks are really narrow by any any standard. Uh, so uh, recently, when I looked at um, uh, just to give you a comparison, look at the food uh, structure I, uh, from Tico's lab. They have uh, a 2.6 Enstrom Crow EM structure for one domain of FUS. Uh So 2.6 Enstrom is very high resolution by Cryo EM standard. Uh, their NMR chemical shifts don't look good. The line width is not good, much broader than this. So based on that side-by-side -side comparison, I would say by the time you get to, you know, half a ppm or so line width, carbon line width, the NMR spectrum, then it's, you know, at the crowd yam level or, or spatial density map level is extremely uh, high resolution spatially. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's that's very uh, intriguing. So, like following on that, uh, designing like inhibitors or peptides that will poison the glucagon fiber formation. I'm guessing you want to modify the ends. Um, yes. Yes. That's a very good question, and we're we're doing that. We uh, so Marty is uh, almost done with ways, you know, with his uh, analogs that he you know has come up based on the structure to see if we can you know really slow down significantly the fibro formation. Uh, and so we're gonna, you know, this, this work is almost, almost done. We, we haven't submitted it yet. But that is the, you know, holy grail in this pharmaceutical, you know, peptide uh, drug formation uh, 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 business. And in fact, there, there have been papers published uh, before the structure was known. Uh, and the tricky thing is you have to find alternative sequences that don't make fibros, but then won't interfere with receptor binding. Right, so you have to look at two two separate you know sets of uh, assays, uh, and so there's a group in Indiana that uh, you know uh, has published various mutant single you know residue mutations and say okay you know in terms of uh, receptor binding or you know still works and still has activity, so we try to you know keep within uh, these you know try not to affect any residues that would interfere with biological function. Yeah. Yeah, great. That's very exciting. I really enjoyed your talk. It's Thank you. beautiful structures. Just out okay, of curiosity. Like other questions. Uh, Deni, Vijay, you have any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want, just Go out ahead. of curiosity, May, have you uh, looked at the possibility of amylin glucagon interaction? We haven't. We haven't. Not yet. There's okay. just so many uh, interesting amyloid peptides out there. Yeah. 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 All right, so with that, let's thank May for the outstanding uh, presentation and research and all the Q&A session. Thank you very much, May. Take care. Yeah, thank you, May. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> bye. Take care, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. So, so Magda, do you have a minute? We can... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a minute. Yeah, nice meeting you, May. So, okay. Um, I'll get off now. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Take care. So, is it, did you did, did you set up the link for the students and?
Uh, I'll do it today, Ram. So I just got dragged to do something else okay. on the weekend. Uh, I'll good. just uh, tell you the minute I have it done, I'll just okay. tell it. It's almost there. We just need to do one more test. And we're going towards the end of January. So <laughs> yeah. We want to set a timeline for that. No, no, I understand, Rams, but uh, it's yeah. it, it wasn't trivial to figure out to be deposited separately and whatever. Now it's all of this is just one more testing and I'll send it this. I mean, yeah, also, also, there's no hurry because we can put it in the website, we can send out the announcement because they are going to take some time to prepare the video. Yeah, I, 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 I was thinking of... really perfectly ready until then. Yeah, I was thinking of maybe extending your deadline by a week or so. Okay, okay. So we can give a time because anyways, we can schedule it earlier than when, when was it? April or May? There is a lot of time. Uh, Mid-February uh, 20th or something like that. No, 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 no. For the deadline, but for the actual presentations, oh, there will be yeah, all the way. In April or May, because we need a month to evaluate. 